ഓം സദാശിവ സമാരംഭം ശങ്കരാചാര്യ മധ്യമാം അസ്മദാചാര്യ പര്യന്താം വന്ദേ ഗുരു പരമ്പരാം ഓം മൗന വ്യാഖ്യാ പ്രകടിത പര ബ്രഹ്മതത്വ യുവാനം വശിഷ്ഠാന്തേ സദർശികണേരാവൃതം ബ്രഹ്മനിഷ്ഠൈ ആചാര്യേന്ദ്രം കരകലിത ചിന്മുദ്രമാനന്ദരൂപം സ്വാത്മാരാമം മുദിത വദനം ദക്ഷിണാമൂർത്തി മീഡേ so namaste everyone uh, this is our sixth session on the gita sixth or seventh uh, i think the first one was unofficial because i didn't record it um but anyway uh, you know today i just want to discuss something uh, profoundly important um there are not a lot of people i'm guessing coming today because i i do know some folks have gone out for mahashivratri and some people in india have kept jagran so i don't expect folks to wake up early but um, uh, that's why i figured that rather than um, going through the text since people have a certain continuity over there we can talk about a topic that uh, some of you all especially who are new to satsanga have uh, not been introduced to and that is the topic of parmana um i may have spoken about this earlier some of you i think in our previous satsanga are exposed to it um there is no harm in being exposed to this over and over and over again because it is i would say and i have said this before i'll say it again um the most important topic that a student of vedanta must be aware of before they embark on the journey of uh, shastra adhyayan um if pramana is not well understood shastra will only bear a superficial understanding but it will not give rise to nishtha the gnana nishtha is what we seek as as uh, mumukshus we don't seek information we don't seek academic you know jargon but what we are seeking is a transformation and the transformation takes place at the level of the vritti and to transform this vritti pramana and the way it operates is extremely critical to understand so i'm just going to recap what the pramanas are very quickly uh, though i know some of you all have already been exposed to it so I, i'll not go into great length but you have your pratyaksha pramana five sense organs okay shabda sparsha rupa rasa gandha these are the senses associated with with our uh, you know there are windows into the world through which we gather knowledge pratyaksha pramana anumana pramana inference artha arthapatti presumption and then you have upamana you have uh, anu, uh, anupalabdhi and uh, of, of course finally we have shabda pramana shastra pramana again to give a quick recap you know i tend to divide shabda or into two over here based on how our gurus have taught i may not be using the perfect terminology but the way i see it is you have the pratyaksha shabda and paroksha pratyaksha and paroksha so let's say you um hear sound this is and you know entering your ear drums and this whole auditory process is taking place and you know it's translated as electrical signals and what not and finally it is processed as you having heard a sound in the external world this is uh, pr- this pratyaksha uh, shab- pratyaksha shabda just the sense of sound rustling of leaves the stomping of uh, feet on the ground so on and so forth now when you talk about this paroksha it has a slight um complexity involved over here which again we have looked at in the past but i'm going to be building on this theme today when we speak words the words are also presented in the form of sounds these are individual swaras emanating from one's mouth and these individual swaras are then stitched together as though they are synthesized together by one's mind and they give rise to a complex meaning the individual sounds ka ka ga ga or a e e or what do you want to call them those are only sounds the sounds don't carry meaning but when the sounds are assembled together in a certain order the ordering is very important if the ordering is absent then again it is you know like greek or latin to us assuming that nobody understands greek or latin over here um so the ordered sounds put together have an associated meaning which gives rise to a brand new vritti in the mind that is built on top of the existing sounds does that make sense so far every sound gives rise to a vritti a a e e each of these sounds as they are heard give rise to a a e e vritti 
But now when the sounds are put together as words and words as sentences and sentences as paragraphs and so on and so forth, a new layer of complexity begins to build. And this is a unique feature. Um, you know, I'm sure other animals have access to some degrees of it, but as human beings, we have truly and profoundly uh, made use of this, um, for lack of a better word, technology. This ability for the human mind to be able to process sounds in complex, um, uh, through complex sentences and such. And so this is what we call Shabda Pramana in our context. One subset of this Shabda Pramana are the Shabda that we derive from Shruti. And so that is Shruti Pramana. Shruti Pramana is a subset of Shabda Pramana. Typically, people don't discuss this a lot, but let's say even the words that I speak or you speak or anybody else speaks, these are also Shabda Pramana because there are certain things that can only be known through my vocal expression. How I feel on a given day or you know what dream I had last night, so on and so forth, cannot be inferred or arrived at through any of our other senses. They can only be arrived at through the verbal testimony of a given individual. Only through the verbal testimony can one know how I feel on a certain day if I report it to you verbally. Or when I say verbally, I also mean in written words. But ultimately, that is verbal. Because if you notice, whenever you read something, you're still translating it as sounds in your inner uh, mind. It still reads as though it still speaks in your mind as in the form of sound. So reading or speaking, they are ultimately Shabda only. You know, the reading is not to be mistaken with, with the sense of sight, right? Because, of course, you process it with sight, but ultimately you translate it as some sort of a mental sound in the mind. Okay, so far, so good. So when we talk about, um, and also, by the way, you know, if, if folks want to turn on their webcams, it would be definitely more interactive, and I can I can see all of you all as well. Um, feel free to. Okay, so when we talk about uh, the rishis, the words that are communicated by them are a parushya. Currently, I don't want to get into the specific details of who's saying what, but on social media, there's a big debate about some scholar claiming that the Vedas are not a parushya, that they are parushya. We'll get to that bit in a moment. Um, what a parushya means and what parushya means. Okay, so suppose I say something to you. Suppose you ask me a question and I'm responding. My responses will typically be colored by my personal values, by my likes and dislikes, by my um, personality, and so on and so forth. And so one can rarely, and not that one should, but one can rarely expect to receive a response from somebody that is not in some way or shape colored by their background. This is given. In fact, you know, my background of speaking in English colors my linguistic ability to speak English and communicate in a certain language. If I spoke Russian instead of English, then you know this conversation would look quite different. So even the background is not just one's personality, but also one's linguistic background, one's cultural background, family background, the country that you're born in, sometimes the city that you live in, and, and many other factors as well. What generation you belong to, what is your age, what is your peer group, all of these things influence the things we say. And so it, it is hard to expect what a person says to be the absolute truth, to be the unsullied, um, uh, let's say, unfiltered truth. Because all truth in some ways is filtered through our uh, mind, through the antakarana. And it, and we've spoken about the four levels of vak. Does, does anybody remember that? The four levels of vak through which sound has to go through? Uh, uh, no? No? OK. Uh, I think some of you are new, so I'll, I'll just um, quickly uh, recap it. Because I know we've spoken about it like three or four satsangs back. See, what I speak. What anybody says, what anybody, uh, you know, even the clapping of, of, of your hand or the you know, thump, thumping of your feet, all of these things are physical sounds, what you call vaikari vak. The rustling of leaves, the blowing of the wind, all of these things are vaikari vak. Vaikari uh, vak means physical sound. Vaikari means distributed or spread or, or uh, you know, in Hindi you say bikhra hua. The word bikhra comes from vaikari, Sanskrit word. So that which is and what what do you what, why does uh, uh, sanskrit refer to as vaikari because if you see we have a vocal apparatus the vocal apparatus is basically your vocal cords your tongue your lips 
and your your whole uh, oral structure basically so the way you know if you if you think of an instrument you, you you're able to beat the drums or you're able to hit the piano keys you're able to you know uh, you know ring the chords of the guitar and so on the vocal apparatus is actually an instrument of sorts because you know all of these things are taking place the notes are being emanated and such and so a continuous sound that is this coming along with the breath that continuous sound is now getting differentiated and it's getting distributed and dispersed through this vocal apparatus and that's why it's called vaikhari vak but prior to it entering the vocal apparatus which you know really begins over here um it is actually a more continuous sound and and it is uh, it is sukshma and so that is like uh, you know one has formed and articulated a complete sentence in one's mind but one hasn't yet articulated it orally and so many times you know when you are having a discussion with somebody you sort of have a sentence that you already formed but you just waiting your turn to speak so that is called madhyama if you go even subtler uh, then you have a level where even the words have not been fleshed out mentally but they are just there as a basic instinct not referring to the movie but they are just there as some you know inclination that ha huh, there is something that i want to say there's something that i want to get out but you don't know quite what it is it will only be evident to you once the words have formed in your mind but this is like the pre formation uh, period i'm talking about and so the pre formation and you know sometimes uh, if somebody says something and it just clicks in your mind but you still don't know what it is uh, another example i can think of is when uh, you have this eureka moment that aha you know you have the aha but again you've not completely articulated what that eureka moment uh, is about then you'll have to you know put it down on paper and such see if, if you knew what the eureka moment was then you wouldn't have to write it down somewhere right but you you still like trying to sort it out in your own head or another example i, I can think of is uh, this tip of the tongue syndrome sometimes somebody says something and you know that yeah, i know the answer i know it's it's at the tip of my tongue but i but i can't uh, flesh it out yet i don't i can't really put my put my finger on it and so that that is all you know at the level of uh, pashyanti that's the third level and then even subtler than that which is like you know completely unmanifest is at the level of paravak now when we as uh, jivas as you know limited creatures uh, as i'm not talking about as jivas i'm not talking about as atma we are all limited as the individual obviously i have a limitation you have a limitation everybody is limited in different uh, variety of ways as the vak moves from paravak to uh, pashyanti to madhyama finally to vaikhari our limitations get embedded along with the vak you know it's kind of like uh, you have a you have water that is flowing through a you know a filtration process but a lot of its nutrients are sort of like captured and some other impurities are added as well and then it you know comes out on the other side so that's how our vaka is manifesting through uh, through these colorations of our individual personality and such now whatever therefore what we say is in many ways uh, it cannot be called a purusha it is purusha because it's a product of my mind it's a product of my mind now therefore if i write a book if i write a story if i write an email if i say something here everything that i say at this moment is a product of all of my past experiences that i have picked up perhaps over this lifetime perhaps over countless lifetimes but it is still something that i have picked up and i have gleaned and i have learned and i have been able to theorize in my present or my past life okay so therefore it is purusha when it comes to the rishis what they present is a purusha because it does not go through that uh, enrichment process and here i'm using enrichment in a sort of negative sense not in a positive sense it is not enriched through the vagaries of their mind what they see is what reality is usually you know the, what we see what we perceive is what we you know often times we see what we want to see as opposed to what is actually there suppose as a person who comes by and you have a certain perception of that individual you will see that person and that perception will be marred by the colorations of our own perception of that person as opposed to who the person really is and so this is the tragedy of the individual which is that every single thing that we perceive is really marked by our own background but when it comes to the rishis their background does not come into the play at all because they are simply intuiting 
and looking at reality for what it is. They are not authors of the Vedas. They are the conduits through which the Vedas are received. And therefore, we say that these Vedas are Aupurusha. Okay, so, so far so good. Now, when it comes to handling this Pramana, what is Pramana? Pramana is a means of knowledge. So now we are going to talk about something very critical, which is how knowledge actually takes place. For knowledge to take place, several ingredients have to be there for the khichdi to cook properly. First is you need a pramata, a knower. A knower has to be there, obviously. Then you need a pramana, a means of knowledge. Then you need a prameya, an object of knowledge. When these three things are lined up, knowledge takes place spontaneously. Okay. This theme that we have covered, I cannot highlight how critical it will be for our understanding of Vedanta and for Jnana Nishtha to take place. If this understanding is not clear, Jnana Nishtha cannot happen. Everything is going to be only academic. When Pramata, Prameya, Pramana are aligned, knowledge takes place. But there has to be an additional precondition, which is that the means of knowledge, I'm sorry, not the means of knowledge, but the knower has to be sufficiently qualified to know. So which means that, okay, you know, as long as my senses are developed, sure, I'm able to perceive the world through these five senses. But let's say, you know, if I, if I lose my sense of sight out of old age or due to some accident or injury or whatever, now my... I am unqualified to receive colors and forms as a means of knowledge because my sense of sight has been rendered defective. So therefore, the pramana should not just be present, but it has to be operational. It has to be valid. It has to be functional. If the pramana is dysfunctional or absent, knowledge cannot take place. So pramana has to be functional. Okay. So when it comes to the knowledge of any subject matter, the mind has to be prepared for it to be able to grasp that teaching. If you are a five-year-old, uh, like my daughter, then she is not going to understand the concept of addition or uh, neg you know negation. Uh, she'll, she'll have some basic sense of it, but it will not work. Because you need a certain pre-qualification for that. As adults, there are certain things that we are better qualified for, but there are many things that we are not qualified for as well. You know, if you take somebody from liberal arts and you show them, uh, you know, the geodesical equations of Einstein or something, sorry, it's not going to happen. Because everybody has a certain background and that background also either precludes one uh, from gaining knowledge or, uh, you know, makes one uh, available to that knowledge. Now, when it comes to Vedanta, the qualification that is required for knowledge to take place is something called Chitta Shuddhi. Chitta Shuddhi is also called Antakarana Shuddhi. Now, okay, so I'm just going to put a sort of bookmark on, on this particular topic about Antakarana Shuddhi. What, um, uh, you know, again, when we go back to Aparusha and Parusha, I just wanted to complete that debate. A lot of people are, there, there are two camps. Well, there are three camps, really, if you want to talk about it. Some Hindus who don't come from a traditional background believe that uh, these Shastras were works of great uh, philosophers. Okay. So there, there's a growing sort of trend of Hindus, uh, especially, I, I, know, I guess I'll, I'll probably not mention, but anyway, there's a growing trend of Hindus who have begun to, to try to modernize Sanatana Dharma and by, uh, you know try to see things in a scientific way. That is a problem because ultimately, if you see science, it has its own pramanas which are operational and Shastra is its own independent pramana. Pramanas don't overlap. Pramanas cannot overlap because if Pramanas overlapped, then they would not be Pramanas. My sense of sight cannot overlap with my sense of hearing. They have to be masters of their individual domain. There's a specific uh, word that we or expression that we use in Shastra called Pramana Kopa. Pram Kopa means anger. So, you know, typic typically, you know, when, you, when uh, animals invade each other's territory, you are invoking the Kopa of another, uh, you know, animal whose uh, territory you've invaded. You don't invade my space. And that's why if you see sometimes wolves and dogs and lions and other creatures will urinate at, at some random areas because they are marking their territory. So in some sense, the pramanas also have a marked territory 
and if you invade that territory it incurs their wrath their anger you know this is a poetic way to put it which is a basically a way of saying that what i see is not the same thing as what i hear is not the same thing as what i smell these are all different domains and they are when diagrams that have no overlaps whatsoever there are no intersections they are independent so if every single pramana is like a circle then they there are no overlaps between them they are always going to be separate and uh, uh, in their own domain and not only pramanas but even the objects of pramanas are independent in their own domain that means suppose i say that my sense of sight is independent from my sense of hearing that implies that sound is different from forms and colors that's another way to put it that means now now uh, which is not the same thing okay so again i don't want to complicate this but let, let's just a little bit of complexity is a good thing because it shows us how much more there is to learn you can have a single object and it may still be available to multiple pramanas okay same object multiple pramanas but then that contradicts what i just said because when if pramanas can't overlap then how can the same object be available to multiple pramanas suppose you have a rose the rose has a certain smell sense of smell everybody recognizes this gulab jal you know how how it smells everybody smelt a rose hopefully in life now the same rose is also available to your sense of sight it's red and it's also available to your sense of touch it's a very silky texture and it's also available to you know sense of uh, sound perhaps or sense of taste you know gulab jal has a certain taste also associated with it and so how, that that sort of contradicts what we just spoke about but actually doesn't because what you are actually looking at or seeing or smelling or tasting or touching when when that rose is perceived is not the object itself but the individual qualities attributes or gunas of the object what the senses pick up are not the nouns the senses pick up the adjectives very important super duper important all senses do is pick up adjectives about the world no nouns in fact nouns are only names and forms that we give it but as we will see in not vedanta 1.0 but in vedanta 2.0 there are no such things as adjectives and there are no such things as nouns there are no such things as verbs there is only that there is only that one undivided untouched unsullied unbroken limitless existence consciousness reality that is brahman and everything else is nothing but a superimposition of names and forms okay that's vedanta 2.0 we'll come to that downstream you know as we continue studying the text further and the best thing about vedanta is there no there's no spoiler here <laughs> you know you always start with this and you end with this you know, pujya samji says something very beautiful that at the start of the course he said that uh, you know any time you have a certain syllabus uh, you are studying a subject you are doing a phd in chemistry physics whatever it may be you have your first subject that you are taught in college and then you also have the last one and then you have this capstone project and you have your phd thesis and you have your you know all of these things and every single semester looks different is it like in vedanta you start with the same thing you end with the same thing but everything in between is just the process of assimilation which is which is very beautiful because there's no spoilers there at all you know it's it's uh, brahman brahma vidya atma vidya all the way okay so so we talked about uh, these pramanas in some um, detail now what i wanted to come to was uh, you know one school of thought uh, which is a relatively modern school of thought says that okay these vedas were authored by very smart people we have already dismissed that in this, the earlier part of this particular satsanga we have already dismissed this when we talked about uh, the the four levels of vak and such no the vedas are unauthored they are aupurushya so that's out of the way now there's a second group of hindus who are traditional i believe you know hopefully we are all uh, consider, considering ourselves traditional sampradayik hindus who subscribe to the parampara and its views and the teachings of adi shankaracharya within this tradition i am seeing more recently that there's been a schism that's developed and i say more recently means probably in the last couple of decades i suppose one says that okay look every single thing that is there in shastra word by word sound by sound all of it is aupurushya that means you take any mantra from the vedas the end or you take a sukta you take whatever it may be that entire thing is exactly as it is there has been um, shall we say no element 
of Paurushaya Tvam at all. I don't fall into that category. And uh, I can see that Pujya Swamiji also does not fall into that category because who cares what I fall into? What matters is what the teacher says. And so, like, you know, example, Pujya Swamiji said, suppose the Vedas were revealed to alien rishis, you know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, something like that. You have rishis inhabiting a completely different planet. Now, what are the chances? that those rishis will receive the Vedas in Sanskrit. I would say very low, very low, um, negligible, right? Because it so happened that classical Sanskrit, the Vedic Sanskrit, not classical, but the Vedic Sanskrit that was uh, contemporaneous to the rishis of you know ancient India happened to be the language of the people back then. And so the ideas that they received, now this is the critical part. Ideas don't have a language. Ideas are those aha moments, those eureka moments, as, as we spoke about. Ideas don't have an associated language. Ideas are an impulse. They are a, like it's, it's kind of like a, it's a throb, a throbbing sensation, a little sparkle or a little bit of a slight movement, something that's inspirational, something that's intuitive. But that cannot be put into human language. But now, the first thing that happens is that as an idea gets constructed, the first kernel of the idea, and as it starts expanding, we have no choice but to put it into the, the words that we understand, if that makes sense. If the idea comes to me and I speak Gujarati most fluently, then I will articulate it in Gujarati. And if I speak English more fluently, then I will articulate it in English, whatever comes most naturally to me. And one heuristic or one thumb rule here is the language in which you dream is typically the language in which the idea will be best understood. Let's put it that way. And so it, the, the Sanskrit that is there in the Vedas, now, now it goes back to the question, does that mean this is Paurushya or is it Aparushya? I would argue it is still Aparushya only if Aparushya is understood in the right way. Aparushya does not mean that every single syllable and every single sound that is uttered and passed on is, um, let's say, not at all conditioned. Rather, Aparushyatva means the idea itself, the impulse itself, has no authorship. The impulse itself comes from Ishwara, but ultimately the conduit. So, okay, I'll, I'll, let's put this in a practical example. Suppose water passes through a pipe. Depending on the size and shape of the opening of the pipe, the release of the water will look like that. So if the opening is very narrow, then there'll be a jet of water. If the opening is thick, then there'll be this whole sort of, you know, dump of water. Like it'll just like come out as a, as a big water dump, like out of a canal. So depending on the conduits that the rishis are, that is how the Vedas will be presented. But that is not the same as the conditioning that we apply which is the emotional, the psychological, the baggage, and all of these other frailties that we carry with us. The rishis are still free of that. But ultimately, when it comes to the expression of those ideas, which have to be passed down orally, they have to, at the very least, be conditioned by human language. So therefore, the words were, the, the, the ideas, the thoughts, the instinct, the impulse was from Ishwara. But the words were in the language that were contemporaneous to Indians. So that is one thing I, I wanted to clarify. Otherwise, you know, there are some people who will say that in uh, Swarga also, they will still speak Sanskrit. It is Deva Bhasha, they'll speak Sanskrit. In Swarga, they'll speak. Uh, that might be a little bit of a stretch because language does evolve and it is to the credit of uh, the, the, the blessings that humanity has been endowed with by Ishwara that we were able to even come up with language and other forms of technology. Language is the first human technology, then comes fire and so many other things. We'll you know, and whatnot. But language was a gift. It is a gift of Saraswati. And we we made good use of it. Okay, so, so that is the, the Vedas. Now, when it comes to unfolding the Vedas, this is how it is to be done. Jiva Swamiji teaches, and he was, I would say, probably the first person who has taught it this way, is a Pramana has to be operated by a guru. If I pick up the Bhagavad Gita, if I want to do just pa parayanam of the Bhagavad Gita, but if I don't understand the meanings, I'm simply chanting 
and there will be some chitta shuddhi associated with it but the impact of the meaning is what gives rise to the transformation okay how does knowledge takes uh, how does knowledge take place let's go back to that topic and let's tie it in to this topic when i see something suppose i th there is this ball in front of me i look at the ball the ball is perceived known object knower sense of knowledge knowledge of ball takes place how does it take place it takes place in the form of a vritti what is a vritti a vritti is a thought what is a thought uh, it is a movement in the antakarana what is the antakarana let's not get too far <laughs> the antakarana let's for now simplify it as the mind antakarana manaha buddhi hankara chittani these four functions put together collectively is what we call antakarana the antakarana is where we basically live all of our life but wait aren't we living our life in the physical world no because everything you see in the physical world is ultimately translated in one's mind only whatever one sees is not what is out there but it is what what's in here whatever one touches smells tastes and all is all in here and so you have a real world and then you have a phenomenal world and that phenomenal world is what we are in touch with 24/7 that is basically happening in the antakarana therefore the antakarana is pretty damn important it's not something to be dismissed it's important it is its own entity now this antakarana that we have is where the, the antakarana any time there is a sense input any sense shabda sparsha rupa rasa gandha or from any other pramana or any words you hear and what not it it is like a you know if you ever how, how shall we again i like to visualize things because have you ever seen like if there's water kept on a plate this happened to me like recently i noticed because we were doing abhishekam at home and we put this water out on a plate and then as i was walking the footsteps were creating vibrations and the water was actually you know uh, uh, moving back and forth like you know in a wave motion of sorts and so if you think of the antakarana as somewhat like that water and then those vibrations are like the individual words and such they create these movements these uh, oscillations within the antakarana much like a wave function of sorts and that is what we call a vritti a movement or a wave again a wave motion through the antakarana is what we call a vritti now what happens is whatever one knows about the physical world out there is what we actually know as the vritti in here okay so far so good the world out there is known to the world in here in the form of the vritti and that is what we call a thought now what happens is if suppose means of knowledge subject and object pramana prameya pramata are all present but suppose my mind is elsewhere <laughs> suppose i am in a lecture hall and i am thinking about some somebody some girl or someone like this and my mind is elsewhere and there is this amazing lecture but at the end of the hour the professor says hey what did you what did you learn because he sees that i am daydreaming i'm like sorry <laughs> i wasn't paying attention everything was there but the mind was not there it was somewhere else that is because the antakarana was not connected to the um means of knowledge in a proper way it was disconnected there was a disconnect and therefore knowledge did not take place so the antakarana when we expand the notion of pramana we have to include the antakarana in the pramana if the antakarana is excluded then khalas finished nothing is going to happen the antakarana has to not only be functional but it has to be available it has to be alert it has to be there it has to be present it cannot be elsewhere it has to be here so antakarana has to be there now here is how one studies vedanta suppose a guru teaches something the guru must know how to operate pramana what do i mean by that suppose you take some tom dick or harry on the internet youtube today there are a lot of uh, gurus out there on social media and on youtube who have gained uh, you know a, a mass following in the last 10 to 15 years including some you know low quality paperback authors like devdar patnaik for that matter or amish tripathi who people see as an authority for some reason on things sanatan dharma 
So now you have these people. Suppose the purport of the Vedas are not known to these individuals, then that is the weak link. So that's it, finished. Game over right there. When it comes to the supply chain flow of Brahmana, there cannot be a single weak link over here. Every single link in the chain has to be robust and connected and well put together and well ordered. That means first we've swept away all doubt, hopefully, that the Vedas are uh, upper Rushya. There's no doubt about that. So there is no weak link over here because the Vedas are pure and unsullied. TK. The next weak link here is myself. Suppose I pick up the Vedas, but I myself am so unprepared and totally unconditioned to be able to make use of this knowledge. Okay, knowledge ends there, nothing's going to happen. So then I need an in-between. So now suppose you have an individual. We also talked about how certain individuals are not qualified to teach. Many people are there, including some sannyasis for that matter. I don't want to take names there, but I'm happy to share privately. Many of these people may not understand the purport of the Vedas. And so what they pass along to us, when it is translated in the form of Vrittis, again, there's a weak link over there. It's not going to work. So now suppose we have the Vedas. Yes. Suppose we have a very qualified guru. Take the example of our, our teachers, Puja Swamiji, or take Swamini, Swatma Vidyanaji, or whoever. Extremely qualified teachers. They know how to bring out the essence of the Vedas, and they know how to communicate it to, um, to the right students in the manner which is assimilable by them. That's very important. Because it is not just enough that the Guru should know. It is, it is even more pertinent that the Guru should be able to teach. If the Guru is not a teacher, the Guru is not a Guru. You are a sad Guru. <laughs> okay, You are not a Sadguru, you are a sad Guru. Because you should be able to have all of the qualities of the Sampradayak teacher, the Sampradayak Acharya, who is able to glean the teachings of the Vedas in a manner that is intended by the rishis in the entire parampara before them. And they are able to communicate all of that richness and that goodness and that fullness and wholeness to the shishya. That is the sampradaya with guru, the one who knows the sampradaya. If the guru doesn't know the sampradaya, the guru is not a guru. We will be very clear about that. We will not be apologetic about this fact. You are only a guru if you are a sampradaya with. And if you are not a sampradaya with, you are not a guru. No chance. No compromise, not at all. Because compromising on this is compromising on life itself. So now you have the, the qualified guru who is teaching an unqualified student. No, not going to happen. Now suppose the student is qualified. This is what we care about. How does that knowledge take place? The ultimate pramana, Pujju Samaji explains this beautifully. The ultimate pramana is not just the Vedas. It is not even the Guru, though obviously the Guru alone has to teach the Vedas because they cannot be studied by oneself. But the ultimate Pramana is the Guru's, how shall we say, wielding and operating that Pramana upon a qualified student so that the Vritti that the Guru has induced in oneself is the same vritti that is also induced in the student. Priceless information, knowledge in fact. The same vritti that the Guru has, when the Guru looks at Shastra, must be the exact identical vritti that the student has when the Guru teaches that student. If my mano vritti is not in synchronicity or is not synced with the Guru's mano vritti, then I do not know the teaching. And therefore, I will be contemplating upon the wrong thing. So then what happens? I need to work on myself further. I need to refine my understanding. I need to maybe gain a little bit more Antakara Shuddhi. I need to contemplate a bit more. I need to ask questions. I need to get the proper guidance so that slowly and steadily and surely moving in the right direction, I ensure that what the Guru says and what the Guru sees is the same thing that I hear and what I see. This is, this is very important. What the Guru says and sees is what I have to know and see, my, see for myself. 
if what the guru sees is not known to me and it's not the same thing that i see because, but i see something else like chinese whispers guru says a and i take it as b the knowledge cannot take place even a thousand satsangs will not be enough therefore it is my job as a student to be exposed to the sampradaya teacher to hold my attention and to allow that knowledge to percolate and to fill me and that is how knowledge takes place and that is how jnana nishtha deepens with repeated exposure over and over and over over time again and again that exposure will deepen that nishtha okay so what what happens here again let's it's this is worth repeating a couple of times until even this process is seen when the guru reads a mahavakya like tatvamasi uh -huh. Yeah, Prashant ji, you were gone for right, a right, few right. seconds. So, when the Guru looks at the Shastra, there's a certain vritti that is there in the Guru's mind because the Guru has solidified this approach to the point when that nishtha has taken place in them. So, when Jay Swamiji, who you know, we obviously consider a Mahatma Gnani. Again, if anybody has doubts about that, what are we doing? But you know, I always say to myself, if, if a Mahatma like that has not made it, I have no business even touching the Vedas. There's no point. So we obviously consider that Shraddha that we have is that the Mahatma that we study under has made it. If that Mahatma, and it's not an if, but given that the Mahatma has made it, what they see when they study the Shastra is very different from what any of us see when we pick up that same Shastra. There's a qualitative difference over there. And what happens is over time, we have to sync with the Acharya and commune with the Acharya, ask questions to the Acharya, work on, work on our own self-reflection, work on our own assimilation, the blockers that get in the way, so on and so forth, until we match up to what's there in the Guru's mind. That is how knowledge takes place. So once Pujya Swamiji was asked a uh, long time back by somebody that, you know, who is a guru? And uh, this gentleman, he told me afterwards that he expected a very nice and long answer. See, we all go with expectations from our gurus. But Pujya Swamiji looked at it and smiled and he said, the one who makes you see is the guru. And a person who doesn't understand the process we spoke about right now may not get the full gravity and weight of this response. But the one who makes you see the truth with immediacy, without any filters, without any blockers, without any inhibitions, that individual is the Guru. And the one who sees that individual is the most qualified of students, Uttam Adhikari. And so we have to all attain that Adhikartvam. And uh, I probably may have a couple of more things to add to that, but I'll take a small pause. If anyone has questions about this. Prashanji, I have a question. So you mentioned uh, uh, Pramana, pra, pra, Pramata and Prameha, right? So in the context of Vedanta, can you clarify which is Pramana, which is Prama, Prame, Prameha and Pramata? Yes. So in the context of Vedanta, the Pramana is Shruti Pramana, Shastra Pramana, Shabda Pramana. The words of the Upanishads, the Mahavakyas of the Upanishads, for example, are the Pramana or the teachings of Sri Krishna Bhagavan are the Pramana. Because they are the they are present in the form of words which give rise to a certain vritti. The, now, the one who operates upon the Shishya, like an expert surgeon, who wields the tools, the Pramana are the tools, they are like the scalpel and the you know different uh, surgical tools. And the doctor here is the guru. The guru will wield the pramana as a tool to operate upon the patient who is the student. The student must be willing to undergo that operation. The student must be open and willing and 
to start with desperate to be operated upon that i have a great tumor a tumor of ignorance and this tumor has to be removed only through the surgical uh, incis incision put by the scalpel of knowledge by the guru who is the doctor that is the allegory of it and the student says please i have checked into the hospital i have admitted myself i'm ready to be moved to the operation room please perform your expert surgery upon me so that this tumor of avidya ignorance is removed permanently and then the guru operates now if you remember if the doctor is unqualified <laughs> the operation will not go well same way if you go to a person who is not a guru you go to some tom dick or harry on the internet or on youtube or somebody who distorted the vedas 120 25 years ago i'm sorry the vedas are not going to reveal themselves because the doctor is not an mbbs surgeon he is munna by mbbs okay he is he is the charlatan he is a fake fellow <laughs> so so this this is the process in which knowledge takes place now here's how i i study okay i take that back here's how i'm trying to study because i'm i believe me you know i may say a lot of things but i'm still very much work in progress i'm still struggling with certain things my own limitations a lot of other things but here i i understand the approach to study studying this well even if i don't always put it to practice so i just want to give that caveat when you listen to a pravachan here's what works for me when it works for me pretend that your guru is sitting in front of you in flesh and blood maybe have a picture of your guru in front of you but you know today i, I think uh, you know vasu for example like you, you are on the call and when we are listening to swamini ji while we are seated at the gurukulam as opposed to multitasking perhaps and hopefully not but and, and then listening to some pravachan at home or while driving the experience is markedly different right and the reason for that is because somewhere we give a greater respect to the individual when they are before us as opposed to when we listen to them passively so to the extent one can please you know and, and maybe this uh, somebody may even want to take notes but first thing is take every opportunity you can to meet your guru first of all have a guru if you don't have one please find a guru seek out a guru but assuming that you have a guru please meet your guru to the to the best of your abilities in person it doesn't have to be every single day but even once a year if you can meet with your guru it will really deepen that nishtha whenever i go to the ashram i am a renewed individual i am born again in some sense and listening to the guru when they are in front of you you are in rapt attention and your vritti is formed so strongly so compactly so tightly that they stay with you and they stay there for good because there there's that immediate connection second is again there's a sort of um, i guess an adhyatmic aspect to it also which is that the guru's presence purifies the vayu mandal there are different layers to reality which you know the conceited scientists may not accept uh, especially these new atheists you talk about sam harris and richard dawkins and uh, several others who have sort of taken a foothold over the scientific community um, Uh, the other guys that Sean Carroll uh, these these guys are naturalists they they believe that only the things that are known to one uh, through empirical evidence is true but the, but if you ever stand in the presence of a mahatma you know that there is some conditioning happening at a subtler level even if it is not communicated and so the guru's presence can be very purifying there's a story um, of adi shankaracharya when jagat guru adi shankar acharya was um, looking to establish his first peetham uh, you know he chanced upon a certain place and uh, suddenly just that environment over there felt very serene he he was you know it just felt very satvik and so uh, then then he looked uh, yonder and he saw that there was a frog that was birthing tadpoles and uh, this uh, mother frog was giving birth to tadpoles over here and the scorching sun was up there and suddenly a snake comes and so uh, oh the frogs in trouble right but no 
the snake actually forms a hood over the frog to protect it from the harsh sunlight so the tadpoles don't dry up because these uh, amphibians have very moist skin and if the skin gets uh, dehumidified then they basically sh uh, you know shrivel up and die especially if you're a tadpole and so the snake which is supposed to be the mortal enemy of the frog actually protected the frog and its younglings so adi shankaracharya had this sudden vision that ah this place where even mortal enemies can become friends and there's so much peace in this environment somebody must have done great tapasya over here and so he saw in his vision that uh, rishi shringa from the time of uh, ramayana he is the same rishi who gave payasam to uh, dashratha ji's wives uh, so that you know after the putra kamishti yagna so that uh, the children were born the same rishi who had done so much tapasya the tapasya still carried on that purity that satvik bhava still carried on and therefore he established his first pitam over there and that's why it's called shringeri okay so that is the story so in that mahatma's presence especially a contemporary mahatma there is so much sattva that they bring that wherever they go they sort of leave a trail of sattva behind them and frankly when you walk in that trail you are capturing that sattva just as you know if you're in bad traffic and there's a car with a lot of uh, smoke coming out you will you'll absorb all of that also right so in some sense again you know allegorically speaking there is that element so being in the presence of a mahatma is a great blessing theek hai that that part is well taken second is if you can't access the mahatma uh, you, you you know you go go join a zoom call you know, go on google meets or whatever and uh, listen to their uh, pravachans that, that are being streamed live because again that live pravachan part matters a lot okay even if that limitation is there which i find hard to believe because i'm sure somebody has like a couple of hours a week to do this then listen to the pravachans in your own free time but please for god's sake please don't multitask while listening to pravachans because this goes back to your the, the first thing we spoke about for a vritti for gnana vritti to take place the mind can only entertain one fractional vritti at a time not multiple vrittis again it's like this you know motion pictures that the mind seems to be absorbing the world in a continuous fashion but it's actually vritti is in very fast succession i don't know nanoseconds or whatever it may be but very quickly t -t 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 -t, the vrittis are one at a time appearing in the mind so when we multitask and we listen to vedanta what happens is the gnana vritti is competing with other vyavaharik vrittis and it will not be able to deepen the nishtha at all in fact again it will just stay there at surface level information level it won't be something good to impress somebody that oh today i studied tattamasi it's like that's all it's going to be you know you will be able to talk about it but you will not be able to imbibe it in a deep sense so never ever multitask while listening to a pravachan the world can wait your 30 minutes or one hour a day the whole world can wait your spouse can wait your children can wait in fact create some time when nobody will trouble you maybe it's early in the morning at 5:30 or 6:30 whatever create a time that nobody troubles you so that you don't need to make them wait okay the and the next thing is <laughs> you know in our previous uh, iteration of these satsangas we were studying tattva bodha um lot of people were tasked with uh, reading puja swami ji's books uh, so the tattva bodha book and they they were asked to summarize what puja swami ji taught there were a few summaries which were basically what they think the teaching is supposed to be as opposed to what the teaching was so it was a normative statement as opposed to an objective statement and i had emphasized that i don't know how many times because as you can tell i'm very particular about emphasizing things and i do it because i know somebody is dozing off somewhere <laughs> and so i had emphasized that please you know as you study these uh, chapters or pages of of puja samji's book don't try to impose what you understand that is a very you know modern approach let me summarize what i understand from this rather the goal should be let me try to understand what the guru is explaining that matters what the guru explains is more important than what i understand i am not trying to create a new theory i'm not trying to come up with some new you know fantastic idea or interpretation my goal as a student is to see what my guru shows and not try to build upon it 
not at this level not at the level that we are at maybe when we become mahatmas then we can build upon uh, the teachings of our acharyas also but at this point we just have to see what they show that is my second third fourth whatever advice i lost track of what i've said and uh, lastly consistency is key it's better to do 20 minutes of pravachans every single day than to do it like twice a week for an hour because if that daily consistency is there then what will happen is the mind will continue to reflect upon the teaching because you know it's a it's a little bit like food the time that we eat food isn't the time when isn't the only time when we are nourishing ourselves but slowly this whole digestive process is releasing the nutrients over the course of the day that is how vedanta also has to be if i study something yes that is the most concentrated time when my mind is completely hypothetically um, absorbed hypothetically and uh, shall we say in the best case scenario ideally speaking it should be completely absorbed but even over the course of the day I, one thing that i see many students of vedanta doing who even after years and years of exposure to vedanta and how many times i've said this it doesn't register for some reason please don't create a secular life and a religious life have one continuous life and the goal of that life should be the incorporation of the vision of the self the moment we create a, a distinction or a bifurcation in this is my vedanta time and this is my rest of my lifetime that distinction will ensure that vedanta remains academic because we have created you know we use a, because i don't know somewhere i don't know where this tendency has come but as students who go to school and college we start seeing things as semester you know uh, it's like so syllabus based right like okay this semester we'll study this subject and this is a syllabus okay now move on to the next thing there is no moving on from vedanta vedanta is the beginning it is the middle and it is the end vedanta is life vedanta is the vision the goal of vedanta is to transform one's whole view of the world and to see oneself as the very whole the complete the purna atma that one is and that cannot happen in a segmented fashion even even if one studies vedanta four hours a day but the rest of the day is like it's not going to happen that vision has to carry over one of the upadeshas that even my guru gave me which is general enough that i can share it with people my guru said ke chintan karte raho keep reflecting upon this teaching over the course of your day not just when you have your earphones plugged in and when you're listening to pravachas and so that that is the way to listen to vedanta and study vedanta or read vedanta and once these things have been taken care of what will happen is that as time progresses on as the commitment and the sthairya uh, buddhi has has um let's say the knowledge has anchored itself that anchor will sink deeper and deeper into the quicksand of the mind deeper and deeper and deeper until it will get wedged at the very bottom of the antakarana and no matter who pulls it away that anchor will never come out again that is how it should be it's like a, you know you're the captain of a ship and you're supposed to drop this anchor of knowledge to the bottom and you have to make sure that the ship which is the mind will not move or sway from there that is jnana nishtha that no matter what happens suppose you get hopefully we don't get alzheimers or something terrible like that but suppose we get alzheimers now tatva masi forget it you'll not even know what your name is you'll not even know where you kept the keys you don't even know if it's morning or night if you have severe alzheimers it's a big problem now does that mean that that person who has gained knowledge but has alzheimers has forgotten everything no they have forgotten everything nahi the instrument of recollection is dysfunctional but the knowledge has taken place so even for a person who is a jnani but afterwards in old age they get alzheimers the knowledge nishtha will not go away it will not change once knowledge has been anchored there is no person who can erase it it is it is there to stay and there will not be a second birth afterwards life samsara has come to an end you are the whole and the whole is all that there is okay any other questions if not then we can close but i'm happy to take questions for fumes because i know we are a bit uh, uh, we still have some time left no questions prashant ji i'm still little confused about 
the distinction of pramata prameya and uh, pramana in the so you said pramana is the way the uh, the veda right the or what's written in the vedas is the pramana so who, what is the prameya and the pramata do you also throw some light on that yes so do we so when i say uh, if i'm the knower or the, the person who uh, gains the knowledge am i talking just about uh, myself without all the senses or does it also include the senses and the mind and so on ah so this is a good question and are you speaking specific to self knowledge or any knowledge if we no, speak about self vedanta vedanta self knowledge then. yes this is where things get a little tricky and we'll have to go on for another 10 minutes how's everybody looking on time you good with 10 minutes 10 minutes more okay i'm i'm going to go on okay all right this is this is the crux okay and i i wasn't sure if we can go so far but let's let's wander beyond our uh, comfort comfort zone when okay this is this is going to this is going to be hard bear with me stay with me i'm going to ramble on for a minute please stay with me when we talk about any object there is a distinction object subject means of knowledge knowledge takes place when i talk about brahma vidya or atma vidya what is the form that is being considered over here there is no form associated with it what quality no quality is it located specially no is it located temporarily temporarily no is it having some object objectifiable metric or something that i can gauge no when it comes to the self the the beauty of this of vedanta and why it is not very easy most people who are exposed to vedanta unless they've heard pujya swami ji in detail or some sampradaya with guru who has been taught by pujya swami ji or some other mahatmas and other um, paramparas will not understand this because when we talk about vedanta the means of knowledge the knowledge the object of knowledge the subject of knowledge the truth of all of these is the self the self is the truth of the knower the self is the truth of the known the self is the very truth of the means of knowledge okay the self is that in the presence of which everything is known the self is that in the presence of which the knower becomes the knower the known becomes the known and the means of knowledge becomes a means of knowledge this addendum is so important oh my goodness okay let's put it this way let's let's take it as a as the simple example first when this ball is known the knower the known collapses in the same place does that make sense the, there's a ball vritti there's a uh, ahankara that that is there that i called my i sense the sense of i the sense i associate as the ahankara now what that ahankara associates with it may be calling itself prashant it may be calling itself an engineer it may be calling itself a male it may be calling itself 36 years old it may be calling itself multiple things that ahankara temporarily in the wake of the ball knowledge has merged with the ball the ball is known to me and in the presence in that instant where knowledge of the ball takes place there is no ball that is different from me. does that make sense because the ball and the ball vritti and the person that i am have all collapsed in the same locus in the form of that single vritti so that vritti is the unifying vritti where the subject and object collapse together i should have said this before and i'm so glad you asked this but when it comes to the self knowledge it gets very interesting the ball has a shape it has a color it has certain attributes i feel that it's hard i can i i have a lot of attributes that i can quantify this ball on when it comes to the self what attribute can be known if the self has no attributes then what means of knowledge can make the self known it's a mystery it's not a mystery but it appears as a mystery and it should the self which has no attributes cannot be explained 
only in the form of words they can only be indicated in the form of words the way i think about it let and let me draw something out maybe that might uh, help or uh, well probably not i don't have any blank paper but never mind suppose you just just imagine right suppose you have a point suppose you have a point over here uh whatever there's a point here and there's a circle around that point the point is the center of the circle and then you have a radius or a circumference around it now imagine that from that circumference you have multiple arrows that are pointing towards the center but they don't quite touch the center but now given that you have multiple arrows which are pointing towards the center you have a sense of where the center is right you can make that imaginative leap to the center even without having to trace the actual arrows because the arrows disappear before they touch the center all of the prakriyas that we use in vedanta are these different arrows which do not touch the self but given your understanding of multiple prakriyas as unfolded and as shown by the guru now you have a sense of the self and as your understanding gets more refined you are able to make that imaginative leap to appreciate because again the word recognize gives a sense of you are able to see it or something you are able to appreciate the self to these various pram, uh, prakriyas the prakriyas are unfolded by the gurus they are used to make one see the truth okay so now this conundrum has been solved that the self which the words cannot go to the mind cannot go to yet there is an imaginative leap a create not a creative leap but an imaginative leap by the guidance of the guru it's it's more like if you're walking in a dark cave and you can't see that the the guide in front of you but they call to you and they say i'm here and so you come in that direction but you don't quite know where that direction is but you have the general sense and so in a general sense as beginners we wander in that direction and the guru makes sure that we wander in the right direction and at some point we'll step into the right territory just through the exposure and the correct wielding of those prakriyas i say this very deliberately and multiple times on purpose one prakriya for example is this gold and jewel ring right so that gives the sense that the self is of the nature of sat that you know all these jewelries are variegated names and forms but the underlying truth is all but the gold the unchanging gold which appears as different names and forms in the form of jewelry another prakriya is that okay now maybe you'll you'll feel conditioned by one prakriya that oh so that means the self is like gold but then gold has to be stretched and has to be beaten and, and there's a malleability and there's a durability and there's a, a ductibility and all of these different properties that we studied in science that gold has and then 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 the the guru will say no 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 beta that is just one example don't run away with the example take what you are supposed to take from the example and leave the husk behind you have to in in a drashtanta this is drashtanta this is a darshtanta drashtanta is the example darshtanta is what is shown by that example the gold and jewelry point you in that direction that look here but you're not supposed to focus on the gold you're supposed to focus on what is shown by that example theek okay. then then they say then they say okay let's give you one more example this isn't work the mirror and the person so then there is this mirror which is a reflection you know this i've talked about this this is a amitabh bachchan movie I, i don't know which one it is either this uh, amar akbar anthony or satya pa satya some movie where he gets beaten up by these goons and uh, then he comes home and he's uh, had a lot of alcohol and so his blood is intoxicated and then he's standing you know in front of this mirror like all bruised and everything and so he sta- he starts applying these bandages but he applies it to the mirror instead of to himself right to the reflection and so then there's that prakriya which is that okay you know this whole jagat is like the reflection and the mirror itself is like the atma and the, you know the jagat is sort of like a virtual world in some sense right through this example then somebody will like oh that means this world is not real no 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 beta now let's give another example then they'll say that okay now you have this uh, pot and the re- you know reflection of light the sunlight and reflection of light in pots so you have millions of pots on the in, in this open field and you have the sun 
that's reflecting in each of these pots and each of the pots have like different colored water one is red one is blue and there's a small sun reflecting over there and every single pot thinks oh i am alive because look there's a sun inside me oh i have a red sun therefore i am a cow oh i have a blue sun therefore i am a dog oh i have a white sun therefore i am a human oh i have certain qualities i'm so smart because my sun looks like this and everybody will have this individuality but there is only this one light which appears as multiple so this is that is on the prakriya and that's also pointing okay now look this is where you're supposed to look so when you have all of these prakriyas pointing at this center which is nothing but the self which is nothing but brahman now even though there is no actual circle defined there is no radius defined there is no center defined you have a very clear sense of where it's pointing and that is where the mind has to go it has to stay with that clear sense of self and as it stays there then what happens now this is a beautiful part i think everything we spoke today was really beautiful but here it here's where it all comes together now look at the ball ball attributes when the mind is taking the form of the ball i see the ball but now self knowledge for knowledge to take place the mind has to take the form of that object but now how will the mind take the form of the self that mind takes the form of the self in the appreciation of the self appreciation of the self as the truth of the knower as the truth of the known as the truth of all that there is and this sir this is what you call sarvatma buddhi this is also what you call akhandakar uh, vritti and the mind is then deeply rooted in its very own source in its very own nature and the mind is no longer the mind and the object is no longer the object and the subject is no longer the subject but all that there is is nothing but the self alone and in that knowledge one abides and in that knowledge of the self avidya is permanently completely without a doubt destroyed for good and there is no coming back from that because vidya atma vidya has taken place that is how knowledge takes place that is how self knowledge takes place that is how any knowledge takes place which is the vritti becomes the object as though as though now the self being free of attributes the vritti in that moment has to appreciate itself as the very attributes less attribute less self and what has happened is the hankara that was prashant hankara boy hankara man hankara child hankara woman hankara engineer hankara that hankara has now replaced its identity with aham brahmasmi hankara sarvatma buddhi hankara i am atma brahma hankara all that there is is only brahman and in the wake of that ahankara does not get destroyed A lot of these neo Vedantins and neo Advaitins, they say, "Oh, you have to kill the ahankara." It's not an enemy, boy. Right? Ahankara is how you will operate uh, uh, in this world. Without ahankara, you can't even pick up a glass of water to drink. But the ahankara has to gain its own true identity from the not the not self to the self. That is the process of knowledge taking place, and that is how one studies Vedanta. That is how one allows the guru. to perform surgical surgery upon us with the pramana of shastra so that the knowledge that the guru has the vision that the guru has is the vision that the student has is the nishtha that i have and ultimately the guru the student no distinction whatsoever the self alone that is how knowledge takes place any questions good okay wonderful so then i think now we can close and i know we said uh, this will be a short session but i think it was worth it uh, om purnamada purnamidam purnat purnamudachyate purnasya purnamadaya purnameva avashishyate om shanti 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 hari om shri gurubhyo namaha hari om ha hari om namaste